take it up with the Lord, and if you think that you're strong enough to walk around without a frontal lobe, be my guest. I don't, I don't suggest it. And people say, oh, music just doesn't affect me. Oh, yes, it does. Whether you realize it or not doesn't change whether music changes us. Help me, Father, to know if there's any tentacles in my life that's changing my character to eventually hate you. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the second session of a 10-part seminar. How many of you plan on being here for the remaining parts <laughs> this afternoon and tomorrow? Praise God. And I'd encourage you to invite your friends. And for those of you who are watching around the world, in fact, we found out last night that we had 240 streams going out around the world from this building. So I want to thank the Three Angels Church for opening your hearts and your doors to us. What a blessing. We are having a little bit of technical difficulty with the streaming, so if you would pray uh, for that, we'd appreciate it. This particular message is entitled, Opus, Identifying the Mind's Mark. Now, opus is a musical term, and of course this is a music seminar, and so we want to use some musical terms in our titles. Opus, me opus means an artistic work, especially one on a large scale a great work, a masterpiece. And friends, this particular sermon is about the mind. And when God created the human mind, I believe it was an opus, a great work, a fantastic work, a masterpiece contained within this little skull that we each have. There is a cosmic battle over you and over me. There are two sides at war, and they're at war for our soul and our choice. We have God on one side, and we have Satan on the other. And both are tugging at our hearts. Sometimes um, the devil forces, sometimes the, the devil compels, but God never does that. God only woos and draws. In fact, when we kind of compare them, we can see that God wants our willing love and worship. Satan wants our willing or ignorant worship. You see, God wants us to make a decision for him, to make a decision that says, I want to serve God. The devil wants, doesn't matter if we willingly choose him, he'll even take the default by living a life of the world, and therefore he receives that worship. So he doesn't care if we're willing or ignorant. And there are those that willingly worship the devil as well. God wants our minds fully intact and fully aware. Can you say amen? Because the reality is that the devil wants to actually short-circuit our mind and blind us. So God is in the business of wooing, putting wonderful things in our life and people in our life and truth in our life, and the devil wants to put every distraction he can in our life. And this seminar is entitled The Distraction Dilemma. And so when the devil puts different distractions in our pathway, it can create that dilemma for the Christian. God wants us to make an intelligent decision based on evidence of his love. So he doesn't want just mere, you know, robots following him and doing whatever he says. He wants each one of us to make a willing choice. I choose to worship God. I choose to follow God. He doesn't want to trick us. He wants us to willingly make that choice. And he wants us to use our brains to make that choice. Satan wants us to make an emotional decision based on our own happiness as we think it is. So it doesn't matter what might be good for us or best for us, we just want to do it because it makes me feel good. The devil puts a lot of things out there that supposedly make us feel good, but in the end, they're empty. And anybody understand what I'm talking about? God wants us to know who he is and what he stands for. So he gives us his word. He gives us inspired writings to where we can actually dig and find out what is God's character. Who is God and what is he all about? And so what God says, here am I. Check me out. If you like what you see, then let's enter into a relationship together. 
If you think you need something that I have, which of course we all do, he says, come, let us reason together. And this weekend, we are going to reason together. We'll be in the scriptures, we'll be in science, and we will be in inspired writings. We will also even peek into the music industry and let them tell you what they think about their own industry. Satan wants to mask who he is and what he stands for. Why? Because really, if the devil came up and said, Hi, I'm the devil. I'm here to, to steal your soul. How many people would go, Oh, sign me up. It, 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 so he doesn't come. Now, some people may say, Sure, sign me up. And some have indeed. But friends, the reality is that the devil comes in all different disguises and forms. And he is trying to trip us up. So the battle is for our mind. The battle is for who we are. You see, this is where we decide. This is where we choose. Remember, there are both sides that want us to choose them. In fact, there's no middle ground. And there's a very real war going on inside of us. There's the carnal man, or as I like to put it, the carnal dog, if you will. And that carnal dog is fighting against the spiritual man or the spiritual dog. Now, why would I use a dog? Because many of us can relate to a dog fight. Has anyone ever seen a dog fight before? They're actually quite scary things. They're, they're very nerve-wracking. But if we would, as Christians, realize there is just as much a very real war going on for our souls between God and Satan, maybe we'd be a little bit nervous like we are when we see a dog fight. And I hope that by the end of this weekend, maybe you leave here even a little uncomfortable, perhaps, thinking, wow, there really is a battle going on for my soul. But here's a key point. Whichever dog gets fed, that's the one that will win the fight. So in other words, on a spiritual application, when we feed the carnal man, and that would be anything that stimulates the flesh, anything, you know, the different kind of junky movies or the bad music or, or the alcohols and all, anything that stirs the flesh or the carnal man. If we keep feeding the carnal man, it's not just those things, love of money, lots of other items, but the reality is when we feed that carnal dog, we're empowering it to take out the spiritual dog. Does that make sense? But the, the opposite is true as well. Praise God. It's whichever one gets fed is the one that wins the fight. So if we feed the spiritual man or the spiritual dog then with wonderful things like the word of God, the spirit of prophecy, um, fellowship with other like believers, listening to beautiful music, watching programs that feed your soul, then we can feed the spiritual dog and the spiritual dog will win the fight. Now, the reality is there's a spiritual man and the carnal man. Now, how do, before we get to that, let me read a quote here. Paul is referring to this struggle in Romans 7, 18 and 19. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No good thing. For to will is present with me. I want to please God. So that's here in my, in my thoughts, in my, my, my soul. I want to please God. But how to perform that which is good, I find it not. Can anybody relate to that one? I can. I can totally relate to the scripture. For the good that I would, I do not. So in other words, I know what I need to be doing. I know what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, and, and I want to overcome as a Christian. But I, I'm not doing that. But the evil which I would not, that I do. You see, what Paul is talking about is that there's a struggle inside. There's carnal, there's spiritual. Carnal dog, spiritual dog. Carnal man, spiritual man. You see, something profound happened at the garden of, in the Garden of Eden. Something very profound happened. In fact, what happened in the Garden of Eden was something that maybe many Christians don't actually perceive. Oh yes, Adam and, and Eve sinned. Adam was, uh, Eve was tricked and Adam chose. But the reality is it, was, it went a lot deeper than this, that they had sinned and disobeyed God. It actually went as deep as when Adam was originally created and, and Eve, that they were the human instrumentality, if you will, with the divine influence. Therefore, they had a divine nature. They had Christ indwelling. Does that make sense? So they had a divine nature. When we chose to sin, 
as a human race, and great-grandma and grandpa chose to make that decision, when they made that decision, what they did is they forfeited the divine nature, and they were left with the carnal man. And so all God has been trying, what he's been trying to do is to bring us to the place to where we're willing to be open to the Holy Spirit, to be uh, infilled with Christ, and let him live out his life within us, therefore we can partake then again of the divine nature. So what if we're listening to, watching, and partaking of things that uh, really fortify the carnal man? Do you think that's going to help us in being open to the divine influence? No. This is a battle, and it's a very real one. 2 Corinthians 3.18 declares, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, that's like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit. That would mean the influence or the moving of the Lord. So what this is saying is, like we've been building a platform here, that if we spend time with God, we will become like God in character. Is that what it says? Absolutely. Now, I'd like to reread this but I'm going to give you an edited version. Yes, I mingled with the Word of God a little bit, so don't throw me out. Here's why I did it. Sometimes when I read the Word of God, I can see that there's a dual application. Like if it says, by beholding the Word of God, by beholding God's character, I can become changed into His character. Therefore, the converse must be true as well. That if I behold the world and Satan, I can become like him. So all I did was write this scripture in the negative. Let's reread it. But we all, with open face, beholding as in the glass, the sinfulness of the world, are changed into the same image, from deformity to deformity, even as by the Spirit, the influence or the moving of Satan. Same scripture, just written in the negative. So if we behold God, we become like God in character. We behold the devil and the world, we become like the devil and the world in character. So how do both sides have access to our minds? This is a great question. How is it that the devil can access us and God can access us? Well, it's through the five senses. We have sight, touch, taste, smell, and we have our hearing. And we are told that we must guard carefully these avenues to the soul. Now, that's an inspired statement, and so these five senses are more than just something that we we could experience the world with. It's, they're actually like super highways to the soul. Let's read a very powerful quote found in Adventist Home, page 403. Those who would not fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. So let's think about this for a moment. If we are listening to our music indiscriminately, for instance, and in fact, that's one thing that's so powerful about music. You see, when you're watching a film or you're, you're watching a documentary or you're watching something on the television, you have to actively be engaged in that to actually see what's happening. You've got to at least look at it. With music, it can be on anywhere and everywhere, even if you're doing work, you're exercising, you're driving in your car, you're, you're at home vacuuming, it doesn't matter. You can have music everywhere. And think about this. If we're listening to the wrong kinds of things in character, what did it say? The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. So if we're listening to the wrong things, and the enemy is in that music suggesting, not even maybe, you know, like people go, oh, I don't listen to like satanic music. I just listen to like all the pop music that's out there. I don't listen to all the the death metal because that's, that's satanic. But do you think that the devil only works through the, that type of genre? No, and that's what's so insidious about it. The devil actually works through many different genres. And that genre is a type of music, a classification of music. And so what the devil will do many times is we're just listening to different kinds of songs that are putting all these thoughts in our mind, and we wonder why we're dissatisfied with our spouse. We wonder why we're dissatisfied with our life and our work, because we're listening to things that may breed um, sensuality or breed covetousness. The enemy of souls suggesting all these things. Does that make sense? 
we're going to open this up this weekend, and it will, make, it will become very clear for you. Reading on, the heart must be every once in a while sentineled. Is that what it says? No, it says the heart must be faithfully sentineled. You know what a sentinel is, right? A sentinel is like a guard, and a sentinel may be put at the gate. Oh, of what, as a Christian? Of our minds. So we need to put a guard at each one of the avenues of the soul, the five senses. Put a sentinel there. Faithfully guard it. So, the quote says, the heart must be faithfully sentineled. That means constantly guarded, or evils without will awaken evils within. In other words, the carnal dog will be stimulated, and the soul will wander in darkness. Now, the battle's for the mind. Why is the battle for the mind? Well, because this is the essence of who we are. And so if this is actually who we are, don't you think God wants to impact that? Absolutely. Do you think the devil wants to impact that? Absolutely. Has anyone here heard? Now, this is an amazing story. The amazing story of Phineas Gage. Has anyone ever heard this story before? A few of you. This will amaze you. Now, talking about the mind and what can happen if we have an impaired part of the mind. 25-year-old Phineas Gage, he was a Vermont railroad worker. And he was a foreman, and this is actually a picture of him. He was a foreman, and he would work with a three-foot-long, 14-pound tamping iron. And his job was to, as the foreman, when they were clearing for the railroads, they would go through all these rugged terrain, and they would have to uh, drill these holes down into the rock and dump this type of powder, gunpowder down in there, and they'd put a charge in there. They'd pack it with sand. Everybody would get away, and they'd go, and it'd blow up the rock. They'd clear it, and they did that for day in, day out, day in, day out. One day, something happened, and Phineas didn't realize that the order of things hadn't happened properly. And his job was to do the final packing. And unfortunately, nobody put the packing sand in. And when he went down and he struck the side of that rock, there was no packing sand. It sparked and it exploded. In fact, the rod was propelled through his skull. It went right up through his cheek and right out the top of his head. It landed, some say, uh, approximately 100 feet behind him. Boom! Pop! And he just slumped over. Boom. You want to know what's amazing about the story? He lived to tell about it. Incredible. It had affected the front part of the brain, which is called the frontal lobe. And this weekend, we are going to talk a lot about the frontal lobe. Dr. Harlow, this was his attending physician, here's what he said. This is his actual skull here. Actually, you can go see it in a museum now if you want. And you can notice on his forehead here, you can see that there's a little cap that's missing. Well, it blew this little cap off, and it damaged the back of the orbital socket, and it damaged his whole forehead. He still lived to tell about it. Here's what his attending physician, Dr. Harlow, wrote. He wrote, Gage was fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, Listen, which was not previously his custom. Before he was known as, a, as an upright man, a Christian man, someone that, that esteemed his friends and his fellows uh, better than others. And he was just a great, a great upright man, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicted with his desires. A child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. Previous to his injury, although untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind. So the reality is, we were, he was radically changed. His character was changed, and he went from being a normal, happy, healthy guy to having fits of rage. In fact, he had, after this, he didn't even want to hang out with his friends anymore. And he engaged in this grossest profanity, eventually left the church and left his wife and went on and joined a circus as a freak Neurologist Dr. Paul McLean wrote this concerning the limbic lobes. Now, understand we were just starting to talk about the frontal lobe. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But there's another section of the brain called the limbic system. The limbic lobes regulate the emotions 
concerned with the four primal or base instincts. For instance, before the injury of Phineas Gage, if someone came up and provoked him, no problem. Because the limbic lobes didn't take over because they were subject to the properly functioning frontal lobe. Because the frontal lobe is the control center. Does that make sense? This is key, friends. The frontal lobe is the control center. So what happens in a healthy frontal moral lobe, it will, if someone provokes you and you say, no, I need to back away and be Christ-like here. The challenge is, if we have an inhibited frontal lobe and someone provokes us, then we rise right back and we might want to fight. Or we might want to take off in, in, this, in the, uh, the light of responsibility. We also might just want to be a glutton, and when it says you need to stop, the frontal lobe says, Christian, whoa, you've been eating quite a bit here. No, 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 I want to eat because I want to eat, and I'll just feed because the limbic lobes take over. And, and understand, this is a kind of a large brushstroke of how this all works, but for our purposes, this will serve. Or fornication, another primal or base instinct, as the doctor calls it. So what happens in a frontal moral lobe that is damaged if he wants to go off and fornicate, he will because the frontal lobe's not saying, no, wait a minute, you're married, you're a Christian, you don't do that. In this regard, Phineas Gage's mind was radically changes so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. We don't know who this guy is anymore. Have you ever said about your young person, maybe a spouse, maybe a family member, I don't even know who this guy is anymore. I don't even know who, th- my children, I've, pe- parents come up to me and go, why do you think my children are such brats? I'm like, oh, whoa, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a big question. My kids are so rebellious. My kids are so crazy. That, but they go down this whole list. And before you know it, we can sit down and do a little interview with them. And then it's not hard to reason from cause to effect that these kids are sitting here listening to all the stuff of rebellion. And by beholding, they're becoming changed. It's really not rocket science. It's how the mind works. So the battle is truly for the mind. And since the devil cannot give us a frontal lobotomy, that's what that's called, a lobotomy, removal of the, a certain lobe of the brain, since he can't give us a frontal lobotomy, like he did with Gage, if you will, he's invented many other ways that can basically do the same thing. And guess what? Certain kinds of music will basically give us a frontal lobotomy. The devil knows how to charm the mind. He knows how to short-circuit the frontal lobes with music. This is a very powerful statement. First Testimonies 496. Satan knows what organs to excite, animate, engross, and charm the mind so that Christ is not desired. The spiritual longings of the soul for a divine knowledge, for a growth in grace, are wanting. So what's saying is that the devil knows how to charm the mind so much so that we won't even desire Christ anymore. Remember we talked about the battles for the mind. That's what we're, we're, we're exploring this morning. And largely, it's the frontal lobe. You'll see here. It's the frontal lobe here. In fact, we as human beings have the largest frontal moral lobe of any creature on this planet. About a third of the brain is the frontal moral lobe. To give you an idea, dogs, I think, have about 7 to 11%. And cats have about 2 to 4%. So I sometimes they're just so aloof. Then you might get a cat that has a little bit bigger frontal lobe, and those are the really good keepers. Otherwise, they're like, who are you? Huh, whatever. I love cats. Cats love me, but I'm allergic, and I'm like a cat magnet. Everywhere I go, when I travel around the world, I'll sit in people's homes, and they go, and the cat comes out. Are you allergic? Oh, yeah, well, I, I do have allergy to cats. And they go, well, they, you, you never, never, ever see them. When, they, when guests come, the cats never come around. And then all of a sudden, the cat comes up and is like nuzzling on me, going, hello, how are you? How are you? And they're going, we've never seen our cat do that before. I, I, I'm a cat magnet. Fr- large frontal lobes, apparently, in those cats. 
So the battle's for the mind. Why? Because this is the control center. This battle is for the frontal lobe specifically, not just the mind in general. Now it's for the frontal lobe. It's the control center. This is the problem-solving part of the brain. This is the seat of reasoning. In fact, this is where our filters reside, and we'll get into that in a moment. Now, in a frontal lobe that is functioning properly, beta waves are present and active, indicating active sound thinking. So if you have any incoming information, like right now, you want to be what's called in a, a beta brain wave. And what that is, is kind of scanning like this. It looks like this. It's very fast, and it actually scans on our brain. So it's like this. These are the beta waves. Beta activity indicates dynamic, critically analyzing all the information that's coming in. So if you are beholding uh, some program, if you're at a church, if you are listening to music, you want to be beholding with your frontal moral lobe in a beta capacity, in a beta state, okay? That's all we need to know right now. There are many other states that the mind can go in. But then there's also the alpha waves, and the alpha waves are kind of slow and going, hello, like some of you might be going into an alpha right now because you didn't get as much sleep and you're, you're getting sleepy and tired. Alpha is great. Alpha waves are like when you go to maybe nature and you sit outside by a babbling brook or something like that and all of a sudden you do this, you go, ah, and it just has this relaxing effect and you kind of just sit there and relax. You're going into an alpha stage. Alpha is wonderful. And throughout a day, any given day, we're going to oscillate between beta brain activity and alpha brain activity. Now, why is this important in a music seminar? Because, friends, if we are critically analyzing incoming information, we can accept it as a Christian or we can reject it as a Christian. Amen? So if someone comes up to me and says, you know, the devil really loves you, and I'm in a beta uh, brain state, I'm going to go reject my filters dropped in here, my Christian filter, and I say, no, I reject that. That is not true. Here's what the devil does with all types of different entertainments. He's learned that he can put us in an alpha state when the incoming information is happening. So we can sit here listening to our music that's just music. It's harmless, Christian. I don't really believe that all that stuff. I'm just enjoying the music puts us in an alpha state, we don't no longer critically analyze the incoming information, and it goes in and changes our characters. Did you guys catch that? So here's the whole point of this. If we have incoming information, in fact, what's awesome about like, the difference between uh, Eastern meditation and yoga, sitting there going, oh, 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 what happens is you learn to put yourself in an alpha state. Therefore, getting rid of your reasoning and your logic, you get that, push it aside, and now we go, oh, we're an alpha. And then the devil comes and whispers in our ears. The difference between that kind of meditation and meditating on the Word of God or even praying to God, you'll get the same exact relaxing, the studies have been done on all this, same exact relaxing effect, but you keep your brain intact, the, the, the beta activity. So the point is, anytime we have incoming information that could impact our soul, we need to be in a beta. And as we go through this, it's all going to become clear to you. Because there's certain elements in music that can put us in an alpha, and that can be a very dangerous thing. Is this making sense so far? Good. Now, when we're in an alpha state, and that incoming information is happening, everything that comes in, comes in without interpretation, without frontal lobe filtering, our reasoning powers have been largely bypassed. Modern science has proven that illegal drugs damage the frontal lobe. So this is why people who go, oh, man, I've never engaged in those kind of activities before. I've never done that before. I've never gone out and been with X amount of people that I shouldn't have been in an intimate way. I don't know what happened. Well, they took the drugs that inhibited the frontal lobe, and the limbic system took over, and they're like, man, I really want to do this. This is going to be great. And we make a bad choice. So illegal drugs, and none of us will argue with that. Some prescription drugs can actually damage or inhibit the frontal lobe. Be careful. 
alcohol, caffeine, nicotine. This is where some people don't like me anymore. But alcohol, caffeine, caffeine. Uh, did I say, by the way, so that's, did I say caffeine? Okay, caffeine. I didn't know if that came out yet. But alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine. You know, we as Christians won't argue with alcohol or nicotine, but we want to argue for the caffeine. Take it up with the Lord, and if you think that you're strong enough to walk around without a frontal lobe, be my guest. I don't, I don't suggest it, because there's devil out there going, oh, let's put some more information about me in him. And certain foods damage the frontal lobe. Certain modern movies, this is where another group of people may say, oh, I don't like this guy anymore. Certain modern movies impair the frontal lobe. It's by the rapid scene of reference. When it changes so fast, the brain goes, well, I, I, I can't grab on that because when we live our life from day to day, that is in stark contrast to how we view the world because you're the editor. You look at me, you look up over here, you come back over here, you're on the wide shot, you know what I'm saying? But in a movie, you're told what to see, whether you like it or not, and it changes, and it changes, and music videos will absolutely fry your frontal lobe, in a sense. That's not actually accurate, but you get the idea. To where the brain just goes, finally, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, oh, and you go into an alpha state, and everything just pours right in. And, of course, Many modern television programs impair the frontal lobe. And, of course, we know that certain kinds of music, and that's why we're here. Now, the prefrontal cortex, and we'll get out of the technical stuff in just a moment. The prefrontal cortex, actually science itself calls it the crown. This is really cool to me because I think of Jesus Christ and his righteousness and the crown of righteousness. And they call the prefrontal cortex. Now, pre means what? Before, the frontal is the front area of the brain, and the cortex is kind of the area, okay? So we have the front of the front part of the brain. That's basically all that means. So we have the front of the front part of the brain. Now, this is where our character is contained. Do you think the devil wants to uh, nab our characters? Absolutely. This is where our spirituality is. Our discernment resides here. Our mor morality is here. Our apprehensions are triggered. Our will resides here. This is where we choose. This is where we obey. And this is where we worship. And specifically, this is what the devil is after. Specifically, this is the front part of the brain that God is after. Why? Because he wants to change our character into something beautiful. He wants us to be filled with spirituality, have discernment, be upright moral people. He wants us to have our, our will functioning properly and say, yes, I choose you. I openly choose you because this is where we choose and I want to obey and I want to worship you. So the prefrontal cortex is indeed the, the specific area that they're both after. Now, let's put it all together. What happens is we have these five streams, if you will, five different streams, the five senses, and everything is coming in from these five senses and all of it is being recorded perfectly. I don't know if you knew that or not. Everything we have ever done, ever done, everything that we have ever smelt, everything that we have ever tasted, everything that we have ever seen, everything that we have absolutely ever heard, everything is absolutely perfectly recorded. Everything we've touched, every single sense. And the fact, here, here's how I can prove it to you. Have you ever been in a situation where all of a sudden, you're right back and like a childhood memory. You can smell it, you can taste it, you can hear it, everything. Have you ever had that experience? Uh, four of you? Have you ever had that experience? Okay, good. The reality is that everything has been recorded. In fact, we have, a, we have a, a machine back in the control room right now that we're videotaping this all on, and it has what's called isocorder technology. So every input, all six inputs going into that TriCaster is being isolated and being recorded. Every channel is being recorded. So we can go back and look at every single camera and the inputs of the slides at any time and look at any time in, in the history of recording it and see, oh, it was all perfectly recorded on every single, so every channel is being recorded. And God did it with one mind. And we have to have these big boxes and all this stuff, and God stuck it into one little head. Talk about an opus. Talk about a masterpiece, amen? 
And we, many times, are messing with the masterpiece. So think of it this way. Everything that we've ever said, everything we've ever touched, everything that we've ever done has all been recorded. And so the question here is, how much junk have we been recording that impacts our characters? Or how much good have we been recording that impacts our characters, right? Right. All of it is recorded. This is why Solomon said, for as a man thinketh within himself, so is he. You see, the things that go in begin to change our thinking, and then so are we. Newsweek had an interesting article back in 2000, Music in the Brain. Scientists are finding that the human brain is pre-wired for music. The temporal lobes of the brain just behind the ears act as the music center. The brain seems to be a sponge for the music, and like a sponge in water, is changed by it. This is interesting. David Merrill's High School Science Fair Project. The 16-year-old David Merrill thought that the loud sounds of hard rock music must have a bad effect on its devoted fans and came up with a way to test that damage. Merrill got 72 mice, divided them into three groups, one to test a mouse's response to hard rock music, another to the music of Mozart, and a control group that wouldn't listen to any music at all. Three different groups, right? Two listening to music, one not. The young visionary got all the mice accustomed to living in aquariums in his basement then started playing music about 10 hours a day. Merrill put each mouse through a maze three times a week that originally had taken the mice an average of 10 minutes to complete. So they all had about the exact same uh, time getting through the maze. Put a little bit of cheese at the end, run them through the maze, and they finally figured out, oh, hey, here's where it is, I smelt it, and yay, I got my reward. Took about 10 minutes. Now, over time, the 24 control group mice managed to cut about five minutes from their maze completion time. So what that is, the ones that didn't listen to music, they got twice as fast at going through the maze because they had learned the route and they were able to retain the information. Now this is very powerful. The Mozart listening mice cut their time back eight and a half minutes. From ten minutes to a minute and a half. They got smarter listening to the right kinds of music. And we're going to get into that as well. However, the hard rock mice added 20 minutes to their time. Yeah, your jaws should be on the floor. Little mice with little tiny pea brains became smarter or more retarded, if you will. They couldn't figure it out, like, whoa, man, how do we get to that cheese? I, know, I can smell it. Like, I don't know, but man, this music's cool, yeah. And friends, it does the same thing even more profoundly to the human brain. And people say, oh, music just doesn't affect me. Oh, yes, it does. Whether you realize it or not doesn't change whether music changes us. In fact, they went later, and they, not, not this uh, particular experiment, um, but the uh, scientists said, this is no way, no. So uh, scientists across the country, after this was released, released on the Associated Press, they went around the country and said, this is baloney, we're going to prove this wrong. And so they, they went and did it, and they had the exact same results. And then they, because they're, they're a lab, they opened up the little brains, and they found that there was unnatural, harmful branching in the brain. And it even shrunk and it atrophied. So the hard rock mice added 20 minutes to their time, making their time 300% worse than their original average. Need we say more? Well, maybe we do. Merrill told the Associated Press that he attempted the experiment the year before, allowing the mice to live in different groups to let them all live together. Quote, I had to cut my project short because all the hard rock mice killed each other. Um... <laughs> None of the classical mice did that. Okay, so if little tiny mice, right? Little tiny mice with little tiny pea brains, if their character can be changed from, hey, where's the cheese to, I'm going to kill you, what do you think is going to happen to us humans? Oh, those are mice, Christian. Okay, well, let's talk about a human. Have anyone ever heard of, of Patty Hearst? She's from a wealthy family, publishing family. Back in 1974, she was a happy, healthy girl going along with her life. She was kidnapped by the Symbionese Liberation Army. 
Shortly after that, she's helping them to rob banks. How was she converted? Well, Dr. William Sargent, Britain's foremost expert on brainwashing, examined Patty Hearst. She, quote, was an unwilling victim of a forced conversion or brainwashing. According to Sargent, a person whose nervous system is under constant pressure can inhibit and exhibit paradoxical brain activity. Bad becomes good and vice versa. Uh, how was this done? Well, and that is exactly what Sarjan argues. This is exactly what happened, precisely happened to Patty Hearst. Here's what he says. Her nervous system was kept at maximum stress by the continual playing of loud rock music. What they did is they stuck her in a room, they played this music, they converted her soul in short order, and she's out there thinking robbing banks with them is a good idea. So don't tell me, that was an experiment with mice. Friends, the devil is forcing conversion on many of us, even in the church. Jimi Hendrix, a leader of a hugely popular psychedelic rock band in the 60s and 70s, was voted by his peers in various magazines to be the greatest guitarist ever. Here's what he said. You can hypnotize people with music. And when you get them at their weakest point, the, maybe the alpha, you can preach into their subconscious what we want to say. You see, the music industry gets it. Science gets it. But sometimes Christians don't want to get it because we want what we want, whether God likes it or not. This is interesting. The eggs are done. Ding! A recent teenage fad was that of taking raw eggs to rock concerts, placing them at the foot of the stage. Midway through the concert, the egg could be eaten hard-boiled as a result of the music. Amazingly, few rock fans wondered what the same music might be doing to their bodies. Dr. Daniels and Bernadette Skubik, in one of their studies, they've proven that any music that contains low pounding frequencies, like the ones we hear at airports or construction sites, is considered to be a brain drain. Rock, hip-hop, and pop fall into this category because of the driving bass, guitar, and other low pounding sounds. And these are neuroscientists saying, interesting, the low pounding sounds mm, 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 actually drains the brain. Dr. Alfred Tomatis has discovered music that contains high frequency helps the brain to recharge. This morning, when the Kets and the Neblets were playing these stringed instruments, in fact, the violin happens to be one of the higher strings, the highest, I think, the highest string uh, instrument, and in those strings in the violins, you're at about five to 8,000 hertz, the, the, the vibrations. In fact, those recharge your brains. So maybe the guy that plays the violin or the woman that plays the violin is going to recharge their brain while the guy sitting in their car going, mm, 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 is actually draining their brain. It's no wonder the Nebulous and the Kets always have so much energy. The higher the frequency, the more the brain is recharged, between 5,000 hertz and 8,000 hertz. The music of Mozart, for example, contains more of these frequencies than any other composer. So science is proving that music, just like frequencies alone, are able to affect us physiologically. In fact, we're do we just held a depression recovery seminar at our little church in the mountains, in East Mountain. And one of the prescriptions from Dr. Nedley is that we listen to classical music because he understands these things. In fact, I just heard a testimony last night from my own pastor's wife. She said, when we started playing um, when we started playing. Uh, classical music in our home, everybody just started getting happier. There's less arguing even among my children. Do you need a, a solution to arguing between children? Then get the junk off and put on something that changes their character and brings them up to a happy place. Amen? <laughs> so does music affect man's physical body? David Tame, in his book, The Secret Power of Music, writes, there is scarcely a, he's a musicologist, there is scarcely a single function of the body which cannot be affected by musical tones. The roots of the auditory nerves are more widely distributed and possess more extensive connections than those of any other nerves in the body. God created us as musical beings, my friends. And the auditory nerves, they're more widely spread than any other nervous system in our body. Why? Because God knows the power and the beauty of music to even impact our soul. 
I had a quote in here where it said that Lucifer was, was there with the angels and the, the heavenly strains of music went up in worship and adoration to God and, and Lucifer was but converted for a moment, I'm paraphrasing, and he went, his heart went out with him in worship to God. Then he went, whoa, wait a minute, what am I doing? And he committed himself to the great controversy. The music of heaven has an amazing power, yet the music of heaven will not force a conversion upon us. But the music of the devil will. Is this making sense? Is this intriguing to your ears? Amen. Praise God. Investigation has shown that music affects digestion. You can actually give yourself indigestion or assist digestion. Internal secretions, circulation, nutrition, respiration, even neural networks of the brain have been found to be sensitive to harmonic principles. It can raise or lower our blood pressure. It's an amazing blood pressure medication, listening to the right kinds of music. It can help mental illness or help to create mental illness. It can help with depression or create depression. It can help with retardation. In fact, they have so many studies out there now. It's one of the, the latest branches of working with the human mind is using music. And they can go in with these children that are just severely retarded and have severe problems processing, and they will play certain kinds of beautiful classical music, and they're able to function at a higher level. Incredible. It can induce insomnia or it can remove it. It can actually change our metabolism, speed it up or slow it down. It can affect our muscular energy. They did a test where they had guys just, just holding up weights, and I think it was the holding it this way or something, and they were holding, I think it was 40 pounds, and they were able to hold 40 pounds while they were listening to classical music, and they could hold it there, I can't remember how, for how long, but hold it there for a very long time. And then they put um, 40 pounds in their hands, and they played hard rock music, and they could barely keep it up like that for hardly any time. It actually affects muscular energy. So if you really want to get buffed, if you're a guy that wants to exercise, the worst thing you could do is to be exercising while you're listening to the junk that they play in the typical gym. Put your iPods in, put something that recharges your body, and before you know it, be like, boom, right? <laughs> but we don't know these things, so we work against it because, you know, that stuff just pumps me up. Well, it may give you an adrenaline release, but it's weakening your muscles. Very interesting. It's so powerful. It actually influences our digestion and many, many more things. In fact, musicologist Julius Portney says, it may be able to do all of these things more successfully than any other stimulants that produce those changes in our bodies. So in other words, what he's saying is, you could use music in a proper way and it will affect you in different ways even more powerfully than the drugs. Power. It's a well-established fact that the human body and the mind can be controlled and altered with music. Many scientific and medical studies have proven this conclusively. The tremendous effect of music upon the human physiology and anatomy is profound. Has anyone ever heard of Frederick Chopin? He was a 10-year-old pianist and composer. He was summoned to play for the Grand Duke Constantine, governor of Poland, Chopin's music controlled his seizures. The cure would last for but a time, and then he would call young Chopin again when the musical medicine wore off. This piece was written for the governor of Poland because he was having problems with seizures. And when Chopin was invited to come, he would stop having it. And then it lasted even for a time after. That's powerful. Reminds me of a story in the Bible. We'll come to that later. Revelation 14, 9. So now let's pull this all together, okay? Let's think this thing through. If the battle is for the mind, and indeed it is, the devil wants it, and God wants it, because this is the essence of who we are, right? This is where our character is contained. 
let's read some scripture about the prefrontal cortex. Did you know that the Bible talks about the prefrontal cortex? Did you know that? It's there. Let's read it. In Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark where? In his forehead. Now what part of the brain is in the forehead? The prefrontal cortex. Okay? So, if anyone receives a mark in his forehead or in his hand, then we know that he will receive the wrath of God. So in other words, we can have in our prefrontal cortex the character of the devil. Does that make sense? Okay, moving on. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written where? In their foreheads. Interesting. One had the prefrontal cortex of the devil, if you will. And here's another group in Revelation 14.1 that has the prefrontal cortex of God, if you will. Does this make sense? Yes. Let's talk about someone else's forehead for a moment. Let's, talk, let's read a very telling statement about Satan's forehead. Satan was once an honored angel in heaven next to Christ. His countenance, like those of the other angel, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad, showing great intelligence. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. I was shown Satan as he once was, a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him as he is now. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he's a fallen angel. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. Doesn't sound like he's having a good time. That brow which I once so was so noble, I particularly noticed, his forehead commenced from his eyes to recede. I saw that he had so long bent himself to every evil that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. I believe the devil himself has given himself a frontal lobotomy. So much so that his, his, his head is receding from where it used to be. So he doesn't think about taking out women or children or animals he doesn't, because he doesn't have a moral compass. And that's exactly what he wants to do to you and me. Take away our moral compass so we become an animal like him. And I say, no. As for me and my house, by God's grace, we will serve the Lord. His eyes were cunning and sly and showing great penetration. A smile was upon his countenance, which made me tremble. It was so full of evil and satanic slyness. It, this smile is the one he wears just before he makes sure of his victim. And he fastens the victim in his snare. As he does this, this smile grows horrible. He's sitting there literally going, <laughs> I got him! And friends, the reality is the devil isn't just in our cars sometimes. He's not just at our workplaces or at the stores sometimes. He's not just in our homes or on our iPods sometimes. Sometimes the devil with his music is even in the house of God. What does that do to God's heart? We bring in the Babylonian pagan festivals, if you will, and the, the pagan worship services into the house of the almighty creator. Just because we might like it because it makes us do whatever doesn't mean it's okay. Are you with me? Amen. So why hasn't Jesus come for us? Well, it has to do with the forehead. I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God, Revelation 7, 2, and 3. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? Prefrontal cortexes, amen? In their foreheads. So God is waiting for a people who will say, I want to be Jesus. 
I want the Lord to be my shepherd. I want to open up my mind, my will, my heart to Him so He can change my character and therefore someday when I leave this planet, I will be more like Him. And while I'm here, I can grow into the likeness of Christ and His character. I won't become God. I don't become Christ. I become like them in character. And that, my friends, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The argument is flying around today that, oh, you know, the Lord just takes us where we are. But of course He does. He takes us where we are, but He loves us enough to not leave us where we are. Amen? Praise the Lord. So there's a very real war going on inside of us, my friends. There's the carnal dog fighting against the spiritual dog. And whichever dog gets fed is the one that wins the fight, period. So what are you allowing your mind to chew on? What are you consuming every day? What are you listening to? With, what are you watching? What are you engaging in? Ask yourself that question. Say, Lord, reveal it to me. Lord, help me to know if I be in the faith. Help me, Father, to know if there's any tentacles in my life that's changing my character to eventually hate you. Because, friends, the devil's playing for keeps. Have you figured that one out? The devil's playing for keeps. And the last thing he wants is a group of people who are going to say, not my will, but thine be done. Because when the devil has a people that start saying, I think I'm off your side now. I don't want to be with you anymore, Mr. Devil. I'm going to choose this side, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to be with God. He doesn't like that, but God does. And he says, over every repentant soul, he himself sings over us. God bless you, and I hope this made sense, and may your names remain in the book of life.